Environmental Board, members of the Woodrow uh, Wilson International Center of Scholars, members from CEQ, members of EPA, and the general public. Welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Cynthia Jones Jackson and I'm the director for the office at EPA that manages the Good Neighbor Environmental Board. We need to ensure that Nancy Sutley and Bob Perciuseppe are out of the door by 2.30. <laughs> so I'm going to limit my, com my comments by first of all saying thank you to Drs. Andrew Seeley, Duncan Wood, and Christopher Wilson for allowing us to be here today. Your assistance in helping us to orchestrate this press release event has been invaluable, so thank you. Uh, we're here today to release the 14th report of the Good Neighbor Environmental Board. Uh, to the President and Congress of the United States. Nancy Sutley will accept that report on behalf of the President. GANEB is uh, an independent advisory committee that produces an annual report to the President and Congress on environmental issues along the U.S.-Mexico border. In this report, the Board responds to the charge set by CEQ to develop actionable recommendations on the potential environmental and economic benefits of renewable energy development in the U.S.-Mexico border region. Before I formally introduce Nancy and Bob, let me defer to Diane Austin, uh, Chair of GANEB. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, and thank you especially to our, our guests here for, for joining us to accept, and I would like to present on behalf of the Good Neighbor Environmental Board a copy of our report to Nancy Sutley from thank the you. White House Council on Environmental Quality. And just to say that because of the, the need for Nancy to catch a plane, their agenda is slightly switched. They are actually going to make their remarks first, and then I will make my presentation afterward. Thank you. Nancy Sutley, as I've said, is the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. In uh, her role as chair, she serves as the principal environmental policy advisor to the president. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Sudley was the Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment for the City of Los Angeles. She represented Los Angeles on the Board of Directors for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and served on the California State Water Resources Control Board. Ms. Sudley also worked for California Governor Gray Davis as Energy Advisor. She served as uh, Deputy Secretary for Policy and Environmental Relations in the California EPA. And uh, during the administration of President William J. Clinton, Ms. Sutley worked for the EPA as a senior advisor to the regional administrator in San Francisco and special assistant to the administrator in Washington, D.C. Ms. Sutley received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and her master's in public policy from Harvard University. So without further ado, I present to you Ms. Sedley. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you uh, for allowing us to uh, to be to spend a little time with you. And it's really um, a pleasure for me to be here to accept on behalf of the President the Good Neighbor Environmental uh, Board's 14th Annual Report. And, um, uh, and thank you for the nice introduction. That's I, I call that the make my mother proud <laughs> introduction. Um, <laughs> But the thing that's not on there is that I, uh, that I was a, a member of the Good Neighbor Environmental Board for four years uh, while I was working uh, for the state of California. So uh, I was trying to remember, maybe Elaine remembers what, what the first report I worked on was, but I, I was like the seventh or something. That right. Something that sounds about right. So it's really, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to, um, to, to accept this report and, and appreciate the unique role that this board plays uh, in helping the U.S. government uh, deal with environmental issues uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border. And I always thought that the, the unique thing about this board is that it really does represent um, the breadth of the communities along the border, uh, state and local government, uh, private sector, uh, universities uh, and uh, communities and and community-based organizations and 
I think, uh, presents a unique um, and very valuable perspective uh, to us uh, on the priorities and the challenges uh, facing the communities on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. So we appreciate uh, all your hard work. Um, you know that you're all volunteers uh, doing this, and I, I just again commend you for for all your hard work. And I know how um, how considered uh, the board's deliberations and the products uh, that you put forward are. Um, you know, the Council on Environmental Quality, uh, one of our important roles is to bring agencies together to ensure that we are working towards uh, the environmental goals of the nation. And uh, as part of that, we have, uh, for the last couple of years, convened a Southwest Border Interagency Working Group to look at cross-department issues uh, that, uh, that, affect, that affect the border. And we certainly, um, through that working group, will use the the report and the recommendations um, as we consider uh, issues surrounding renewable energy development in the border region. And we have, uh, through that group, um, used your recommendations from the from the last report to inform a number of federal agency efforts. So I can talk for a minute about some of the things that we've been working on since your <laughs> since your last report. Uh, in the last report, you made recommendations that uh, U.S. agencies need to improve their co cooperation and collaboration uh, along the border. And so, for example, to that end, the Department of Interior, the Forest Service, and the Border Patrol have worked to strengthen their cooperative partnership. Under an interagency agreement, nine conservation projects are moving forward that will benefit endangered species and habitat, which is a priority that you identified in your last report. Uh, Customs and Border Protection has provided the Department of the Interior with nearly $7 million to mitigate the impacts of construction of border security infrastructure on natural and cultural resources. And they've used those funds to maintain watering stations for endangered animals that are unique to the border region. Uh, for habitat restoration work um, over a number of things in completing wetlands restoration uh, and enhancement. Uh, in your report last year, you also noted that vehicle emissions are one of the largest contributors to pollution uh, along the border and recommended that the administration work to implement measures that reduce vehicle idling times at the ports of entry along the border. Uh, since those recommendations were made, the U.S.-Mexico Joint Working Committee on Transportation Planning has begun to measure border weight and travel times. And the Federal Highway Administration is looking to establish a baseline for vehicle emissions data at the border to help to develop strategies to reduce emissions. So those are a couple of areas where uh, the recommendations that you made in your last report are informing how federal agencies uh, approach the border region. So. Uh, we're very much looking forward to reviewing uh, this report, the 14th report, and your recommendations uh, to help us further uh, in our work of, on clean energy development in the border region. Now, the President believes that developing and promoting clean energy opportunities is, is essential to, to a strong border region and to a strong nation. Uh, he, earlier this year, he announced an energy blueprint for the country and set an aggressive goal of obtaining 80 percent of our electricity from clean sources by 2035. The border region is very well positioned to be part of this clean energy rev revolution with uh, extraordinary potential for solar and wind and geothermal. Uh, and to support this potential, the Department of Energy is working to develop best practices for energy conservation and alternative energy productions in states along the southwest border. This past year, DOE's National Renewable Energy Lab and Mexico's Institute for Electricity Research signed a memorandum of understanding aimed at facilita facilitating cooperation on wind energy development and, uh, and agreed upon a formal work plan for this effort. Uh, more broadly, uh, earlier this year, we announced the formation of a renewable energy rapid response team that's co-led by CEQ, the Department of Energy and the Department of the Interior. And the purpose of this team is to improve federal coordination 
and, in, and ensure timely review of proposed renewable energy projects and transmission lines. Uh, and, uh, and that effort is, is going well. Uh, the administration has also been very focused on energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency. If the U.S. became 20 percent more energy efficient, we'd save about $200 billion a year and create, I think, a lot of jobs. In February of this year, the President launched the Better Buildings Initiative that's focused on commercial building efficiency uh, to, uh, with a goal of reducing commercial building energy use by 20 percent by the year 2020, and that would reduce energy costs for American businesses by $40 billion. So uh, just a couple weeks ago, the President and 60 city and private sector leaders announced $4 billion in commitments, including $2 billion in private capital to retrofit offices, schools, and city buildings across the country. We're looking forward to keeping you all updated on this work and many of the other uh, clean energy initiatives that we're focused on as we formally respond to your report. And I know even as we're talking about uh, the 14th report, you're, you're already uh, starting to look at the 15th report. And uh, I understand that you're considering focusing uh, on uh, looking at the potential environmental and health benefits of investing in infrastructure projects along the U.S.-Mexico border. And the President strongly supports uh, infrastructure development as a way of uh, uh, increasing economic growth and bringing long-term social benefits. And this is clear in the American Jobs Act, uh, which would put thousands of Americans back to work modernizing our roads, our bridges, and other infrastructure. Uh, certainly, the President has been urging Congress to pass uh, the American Jobs Act and the transportation piece, which would immediately invest $50 billion in transportation infrastructure. And he's also proposed a $10 billion investment for a national infrastructure bank to fund projects in transportation, water, and energy infrastructure. So um, again, I think the, the work that you do, uh, the agencies, uh, I know the number of federal agencies who participate in this, and certainly the support from EPA, uh, this is all very critical work that you're doing to face the economic and environmental challenges uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border. So thank you again for your hard work, uh, for your recommendations, uh, and the work that I know you will <laughs> undertake in writing the 15th report. So thank you very much. And I know Deputy Administrator Perceptive would like to make a few comments as well. So we will make that, and then we'll see if we have time for any comments at the end. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can everybody hear all right? It's always a standard question at the beginning of a speech. <laughs> Cynthia and Diane, thanks so much for uh, the invitation to come. And you know, EPA's role is uh, with the board is 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 both uh, technical as well as organizational, and we we are proud of our work in helping uh, keep the board um, uh, nurtured, you know, from the management perspective, the administration perspective. And uh, we're also uh, excited about this 14th report. Um, you know, renewable energy is a pretty important uh, subject, and I'll have a couple of comments on that in a minute. I, I should also thank the Wilson Center. It's always a great to come across the, the causeway here from EPA over to the Wilson Center uh, and uh, the support uh, for the space and, and the work that's going on. Um, you know, there are a number of pretty uh, broad recommendations in the report, and I, I think it's really going to be incumbent upon all of us, including uh, board members as follow-up, to, to see how we follow up on these. There are many things that EPA is doing. I'm not going to go through that list because I think later on today, Michelle and Keith, who's in the back from our regional office in San Francisco, are going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. But I do want to talk a little bit about some of the themes that, that you've uh, outlined here and how they, how they relate. You know, one of them, which I think is, you know, on the surface you'll say, well, this is pretty, pretty obvious, uh, the idea of improved coordination among the federal agencies. Uh, I don't know. Um, that seems like... Uh, something we should implement, Nancy. So, uh, um, um, uh, but you don't know how hard it is 
to overcome the, uh, the forces that are at play sometimes that drive us into our, into our own niches, because we're inundated every day with whatever Congress wants us to do, uh, whatever the laws that we're in imp implementing uh, force us to do. And we have to force ourselves to carve out that time to make sure we stay coordinated. Um, it is one of the most important things sometimes that a deputy does at, at different agencies is have those relationships with the other agencies. So I see this almost as a personal reminder to me uh, that I need to make sure that EPA stays coordinated with the other agencies. And uh, you have already said uh, what CEQ's one of the primary roles or key roles that CEQ has of coordinating us and what better place uh, uh, for me to thank you, Nancy, for the work that you guys do on the Southwest Border Interagency Working Group, uh, which CEQ chairs, which obviously is a forum we have already to try to deal with some of these interagency issues. So we're, uh, we're taking this call uh, from all of you uh, for improved coordination is that not so much a condemnation that we're not doing it, but a call for us to double up, uh, you know, the amount of uh, energy we're putting into it. And you, you need to insert those energy. Anybody here a scientist know what entropy is? You know, it's the, it's the tendency of the universe to go to disorder. Well, there's the same, uh, I know, don't get panicked. Uh, uh, there'll be a quiz. There's going to be a quiz and, and a movie, too, on that. But the, uh, but the key is that there's, there's institutional entropy. And if you're not putting the energy in, all the time, it'll tend to more t toward disorder, and I think that that's what your call is, and that is what we need to uh, to rise to. And of course, the board itself is a perfect example of this coordination between state, local, and other different federal agencies and and, and different governments. So, um, uh, you 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 lead by example, and we're very appreciative of that. And when you you know yourselves, when you're all together. Uh, the, there's an energy level that changes uh, and that innovation and creativity is enhanced when you have that kind of coordination. The second theme that I, 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 that I see in this report that I think is pretty important for us is that uh, renewable energy is really important. It's, I, you know, it's very difficult, although I'm sure they exist, to find people who think that renewable energy is not a good idea. You know, who could be opposed to, just like interagency coordination, uh, you know, the idea of energy that will just renew itself and that you, you know, we, we can be, uh, we can move on with our lives. Um, but um, what you've pointed out, which I think is very, very important and, and something that we have to keep in our minds as we're moving uh, quickly forward on increasing the uh, renewable energy is that we need to take care to avoid the unanticipated environmental, social, and other potentially economic impacts of, of, of how we implement it. And you have done, I think, a really great service in this report, which I, believe it or not, had a chance to take a quick look at before we, uh, before this meeting. Um, you really have pointed out some of those potential pitfalls that, that we need to keep an eye on. And uh, I think that is a, coming from all of you who are so intimately involved with the border area and hearing what you see are the things that we should be being careful about it means a lot to us, and it has a carries an extra. It ca carries an added weight uh, in our in our, our review of these things. Um, you know, um, it's it's sort of like the it's sort of like the sweet spot that you look for the the idea of renewable energy that has all the benefits associated with it, but to do it in a way that doesn't create economic uh, or other environmental uh, disruptions at the at the local level. Um, because if we do it right, what we'll have is more prosperity and a cleaner environment. So you, you've got all these different conflicting uh, potential outcomes. What we want is to maximize the outcomes of improved economic and, sust uh, and community sustainability and, in and improved environment over the long haul, at the same time minimize the impacts that you can potentially have from how it's um, uh, developed. And of course, Nancy's already mentioned the the potential impact, I know this is shocking, of, of solar energy in, in the southwestern part of the United States and in that whole area of, of Mexico and the United States along the, the, the border. Um, it's a pretty uh, wind as, as well, but I know we just uh, approved a, a 20 megawatt solar energy park in Picture Rock, uh, Arizona, has the ability to, to power 3,500 homes. Um, 
uh, these are these are important developments. But I wanted to point out a program that, uh, and I said I would leave talking about EPA to, to Michelle and, and Keith, but I want to say one thing quickly about uh, something EPA is working on. Uh, you know, EPA works on lands that are contaminated. We have a whole bunch of programs related to that, and I'll just mention a couple, you know, things like Superfund site cleanups or Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or some people call RECRA, cleanup sites and, uh, and brownfield sites. Well, what better places to be looking at as a place that we could do renewable energy development? And there are a number of sites around uh, the border region um, uh, on both sides of the border that I think uh, will meet these kinds of criteria where this is really a kind of redevelopment that we should be, should be looking at. So um, uh, I'll end with simply saying that uh, the correlation uh, between economic prosperity and, and environmental protection is pretty high. No matter what um, uh, rhetoric you sometimes hear, the basic data generally shows uh, those kinds of relationships, both from a jobs perspective as well as a community well-being perspective. And um, if we do this right and if we follow some the recommendations that you guys are pushing us on in terms of coordination and looking at making sure we avoid the pitfalls, um, I think that we will be seeing projects and programs that will continue, as your other reports have analyzed, ways to lift, uh, lift the entire region and the standard of living in the entire region. And I think that's the overarching goal that we all have. And so I'm happy to be here in support. Uh, I'll work, uh, and EPA will work with Nancy and CEQ as we look at the report and, and see how we integrate it. And I'm just happy that EPA is able to play a, a small and supporting role in keeping um, keeping uh, the work of this board um, on the forefront of our minds. So thank you for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to more work. And I like the idea of the 15th report as well. Infrastructure is a pretty important thing. We've that's one of the things that EPA has done a lot of work on in the border region, um, and uh, so we would look forward to see your assessment on how that's been going and what more we all need to do there. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one minute. So <laughs> if there is I one shouldn't have talked a, so a, long. No, no, no. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. We, we understand exactly and appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedules. But is there one pressing <laughs> question? Um, it puts a lot of pressure on the asker. I tell you. <laughs> um, while you're thinking of it, I just want to say a special thanks because you did us a huge favor back in March when we were had a few of our board members, if you recall, were going to roll off, and we all said, please don't let that happen until at least December. And so thank you very much for allowing this board to stay together because part of the reason that this report exists is because those members were especially uh, productive and critical in getting this, this report done. So thank it's you. It's the, the mysteries of the Federal Advisory <laughs> Committee Act that, that the, we, you have to have a very high level of uh, sophistication to manipulate that. Well, we appreciate whatever you had to do to I do that. I mean, do it justice. <laughs> there you go. Whatever you had to do, we appreciate it because it was critical. And I see that Steve Neal. Yeah, just has thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I said you all so you would know I'm from Texas. But, uh, you know, I think it's great to hear what, has, what actions have been taken from our previous report's recommendations. And uh, that's always good to know. Uh, and I would just tell you that in the past we recommended, for example, that the Department of Defense transfer uh, emergency response protective equipment to Mexico, and somehow or other it happened. Now, I don't know if it was going to be planned and we just stuck in the report and it happened, but it happened. So, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and so I think it's great to know that. And I think, you know, it would be uh, fruitful uh, as far as the board members were concerned if we could get, uh, you know, some kind of uh, written list of what's been done by your group that you mentioned. I think we'd appreciate it. But thank you all both for coming. I know. It's, it's great to have you come, and we all appreciate it. Well, thanks. So we, we tried to do that for the, I think, for the last report. Uh, hopefully you got that at some yes, point. Yes, we did. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was a kind of a long, tortured process, but hopefully we will we'll, uh, make it faster this time. <laughs> we so. appreciate it. And again, we know you have to run, but thank you so much. Thank we certainly you. appreciate thanks. your being here. Thank you.
Okay, so we're not going to do an overview. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay, we'll let people shift around, and as I mentioned, that we'll just do a little flip-flop. What I'm going to do is to provide a very brief overview. You actually heard, for those of you who haven't seen the report yet, um, some of the highlights in their responses, but we'll go ahead and, and walk through some of, some of the key um, I items that we have brought up in this report. Um, now, in terms of m moving slides, the uh, is he coming? There. While they're doing that, I will just make a, a couple of remarks um, in terms for those folks. As, as far as the report goes, so we held up a copy here in terms of what it looks like. I want to call your attention to a couple of areas that people don't necessarily always look at when they're looking at a report. And that is because, first of all, in terms of, of getting this report done, we owe a lot of thanks to the board. And while I am up here because I am in the role of chair to summarize, this is the work of everybody on this board. We had subcommittees and a lot of work to get that done. Um, but we also had an incredible amount of help from dozens of individuals and organizations. And so I urge you to go to the back of the report and look at the list of acknowledgments to give you a sense of the variety of people and organizations from many, many different perspectives who provided input to us and to offer a special thanks to those folks. Because as board members, we are certainly not experts in all of the topics we are given, and we certainly appreciate the assistance we get from everyone else. So there, we, I'll take it and just so <laughs> somebody's got it. There we go. All righty. And so again, um, and then finally, certainly thanks to the folks from um, the EPA and, and the people uh, who help us uh, in terms of getting this report out, and that's the scientific consulting group. So what you have here, and I am going to do very good, is to, as, as has been noted, the topic of our report Actually, I'll back you up, is the potential, and you notice the highlighting of the environmental and the economic benefits of the renewable energy development in the border region. Now, we are, as we are aware, um, renewable energy development is, and renewable energy production is expected to increase for many, many reasons, where there are a lot of positive aspects to um, and renewable energy production, everything from fostering our nation's independence to uh, drawing upon what, as we've heard, is a supply of energy that is inexhaustible. Uh, I, what we want to point out, and we are the reason we were asked to take a look at this topic, is that in fact the state, U.S. states along the border with Mexico and those specific communities within them will make si significant contributions, and I would say already have made significant contributions in this area. And so that's, that's the reason that we are here to be looking at this particular report. Now I want to spend a couple of minutes just going over some of the characteristics of the border region to remind us of the context within which we are looking at this particular issue. And so as we are aware, the, we, this is a region of very rapid economic and also population growth. And that puts particular demands and strains on those communities and their leaders who are trying to address that. There are certainly asymmetries, we've heard about that already today, between the U.S. and Mexico on a number, both on infrastructure, on social services, on policies, et cetera. We are in regions along the border of very rapid urbanization, which puts that particular strains on communities, as well as, I would add, areas that are very, very rural. And we have all of that to look at. And how do we meet the needs of these folks? Um, we also have high rates of poverty. On the positive side, this is an area of international commerce and trade, as we have also heard, and it's an area where that is central. And to not forget that we have a very distinct ethnic identity, that m people in this, this region recognize it is a unique region and something that we want to maintain. 
Now, when we look at the characteristics of the border region, we also look at some of the environmental characteristics. And again, I think this is what drove a lot of the board's concern and interest in, in really taking very seriously the, the task of addressing this question this year. And while we have issues in, related to water supply and water quality, air, the treatment of waste and hazardous waste. We also have, as has been pointed out, concerns about habitat and species product, protection as well as challenges in terms of conservation. And so keeping all of that in mind as we move forward and think about renewable energy, what we did in this report is we've, ad we've addressed several topics and we've taken a look at five particular resources, and that is solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, and hydropower. And for each of those, as you can see here, we addressed everything from resource availability and technology to looking at the impacts of production and transmission, as well as the mitigation of negative effects. And then, in addition, we look specifically at the economic opportunities, which do include job creation, but also include other things such as municipal energy savings, increased revenues, and, in, and various types of investments. Now, I'm going to start actually with that, with the jobs and economic development, because in fact, if we look, we recognize that energy-related jobs may in fact help address high rates of unemployment and underemployment in the region. And uh, studies that were conducted, I have a couple of examples. Back in 2009, we heard a little bit already this morning in terms of the, the potential number of jobs. But I've looked at that simply increasing the new renewable electricity standard could generate hundreds of thousands of jobs. And one study by the Union of Concerned Scientists, for instance, estimated that for the same amount of electricity to be produced with fossil fuels, if you replace that with uh, renewable energy sources, you could create as many as three times the number of jobs. So there is certainly the potential for job creation in this area. Beyond job creation, we have a concern, as you can see, that the border region not simply create a lot of energy that gets exported out. Uh, another, the other flip side, and we've heard already about this, is the potential related to economic development. Having access to the energy that is produced in this region is critical to these communities. And we heard some of the, the suggestions. We had examples of where the, you have direct effects, such as, as providing people with lower cost um, energy, electricity, various things that are done at the local level to make sure that the communities do, in fact, benefit from this energy development in many different ways. And so, again, the board is encouraging responsible efforts to improve the economic conditions as we take advantage of and enable border communities to take advantage of these resources. Okay, now let's move to this broad question of resource development and planning. And what is it that the board was looking at and what are we recommending here? Now, the, we've heard that while the renewable, there are a lot of advantages to renewable energy production, there are potential negative impacts. These, some of these projects can have in, enormous impacts in terms of the footprint from land, the use of, of both ground and surface water, vegetation, wildlife, as well as the visual and noise impacts for those people who live near these, um, some of these farms and other facilities. And so I, I, what I'm trying to do in this is, is to just give you some highlights and some examples through the, the here and, and encourage you to read the, the report for, for a lot more details. But here's one of those examples. EPA has the Repowering America's Land Initiative, which we just heard from the deputy the administrator a little bit about that, which is basically aiming to do a comprehensive inventory of disturbed lands that might be used. So we're, we're doing careful development as we look at wh where and how to move forward. In addition, there are numerous multi-jurisdictional uh, initiatives, a couple of them being the Department of Energy has the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, um, and then there are new initiatives such as the Bureau of Land Management, Solar Energy Zones, that are opportunities for partnership. We have heard that word a lot today in terms of developing the kind of partnerships are, that are necessary to do this kind of development in a, in an, a responsible way. Uh, and so again, our, we endorse that note, careful planning and execution of the projects and initiatives. 
and to uh, uh, obviously avoid wherever possible negative impacts. And when we do know that there will be some of those impacts, to be sure that we are moving in early and mitigating, uh, minimizing and then mitigating them. Now, another area that the board looked at was this question of financing. It's uh, critical that we look at this uh, performance-based financial incentives that encourage the actual production of renewable energy, that aren't simply giving people write-offs, et cetera, but there's, a, there's a, a measurable output at the end of that. And we have various tools that are already in place, such as the Clean Renewable Energy Bonds or the CREBS, which enable state and local governments to finance projects. Uh, we have the, heard this morning for the board, and are, you're going to hear very shortly from the North American Development Bank slash Border Environment Cooperation Commission perspective in terms of really assessing and financing renewable energy projects and actually adding to some of their criteria around that uh, in the border region. And that is critical as well as the projects, all projects are going forward. And so certainly the board is recommending that the fe at the federal level that we provide greater certainty regarding renewable energy production and energy saving technologies and in order to help drive investment in these areas. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't throw up this slide. While we were asked to look at renewable energy development, the board was feels very strongly that energy efficiency is key to this, that looking at just renewable energy development outside, that in fact energy efficiency, as is says here, is promotes energy efficiency projects and initiatives as partial or complete alternatives prior to and in conjunction with renewable energy development. And that is, is critical and, you, and again from a definition is the idea of, of simply looking at what we were going to provide. Uh, necessary activities, but simply using less energy to do so. And you can see there are already examples of this. There are examples at the, of the federal government coordinating with non-governmental organizations and with international financial institutions to offer the, the types of incentives that are necessary at the household level. Also, certainly the Department of Energy is financing research and development on energy efficiency technologies, and we encourage all of that to continue. Now, you've heard this already a lot this morning, and that is coordination, and it is one of those recommendations that we have in this report, because the, the development of renewable energy technologies requires so many different players at so many different levels, um, from the local, everything from who, who is in charge of permitting to financing to um, mitigating impacts, et cetera. And so we certainly support an approach that really emphasizes the coordination and, and ensuring that local, state, tribal, and other federal agencies are all involved as projects are moving forward. And you can see again, here are a couple of examples. This is already going forward. The top example comes out of New Mexico, where 64 public, private, and nonprofit entities have gotten together to create a border region marketing and development effort in order to promote uh, renewable energy and energy conservation strategies. These are the kind of examples we were looking for in, in the report as we were preparing the report that there are things that are going forward. In the same way, um, the U.S. and Mexican governments, we've already heard, are sharing all sorts of information in terms of technology, smart grid, et cetera. Um, and so I want to end with this slide, and that is to talk about what's necessary to, to enable local communities to do what they need to do. And we certainly feel very strongly that the education and outreach roles, and while that may not be the primary responsibility of the federal government, the federal government certainly can assist and in partnership with those tribal state and local entities. And that's not just governments. That's all the little, the, the nonprofit organizations, the universities, the academic sectors, entities at all of those levels to really work together to ensure, because what we have heard and, and certainly what we've experienced, the challenges of even staying on top of this topic, understanding what's going on, there is a lot moving forward very quickly, and how do we keep local communities, state governments, university people who study one very narrow area but not the rest of it, all of us are charged, those non-governmental organizations who are out there trying to stay up and stay on the ground. This is, this is a huge effort, and it's an undertaking that's, that's going to require all of us working together. Um, not only do we need the information about 
the technologies, the best practices, the costs and benefits, certainly as plans are going forward, we need to use and we need to assess data and be able to use that data in order to understand projects that are being proposed. And the, uh, another positive example is in those areas where people are providing technical assistance to communities, to businesses, to universities, to do energy audits, to be, in, be able to take a look. We can talk about, oh, we need to be more efficient. We need to use more technologies. But how do we move from that desire to the reality of doing it? And so a, a key piece of that is certainly the education and outreach. And as I said, I would end there. Um, the report, uh, actually, I'm going to back up uh, and give you, because the report, it, because we are just issuing it, the report will be available on the Ganeb website, and I will, it is, okay, then it, it is available, we were, well, obviously, we, we want to officially present it before we make it public, but that report is available, and so encourage um, all of you to take a look. It's available in a PDF form. There are also hard copies available for anybody who would like a copy as well. So with that, I end my remarks, and I'd like to open first to board members to correct me, add to what I said, or something that you would have emphasized if you were up here, and see if anybody wants to, to has a comment to make on that. Jose. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to congratulate you for, for the great presentation. I think you describe uh, aptly the, the work that the uh, board has done. A and it is the good neighbor environmental board. It's not the good uh, neighbor economic board. So clearly the emphasis for us and the primary emphasis was for us to look at the environmental impacts and way where we can accommodate growth uh, to the extent possible and economic development. But again, I want to commend you for the job uh, that you did with uh, this year's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Diane. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet uh, TV Productions. Thank you for uh, sharing this report. But looking at the, the tribal nature of this, we usually think of local, state, and federal agencies and all the entities working together in education, investment, and research. How can we uh, better incorporate the tribes and look at uh, the uh, synergy that they have also because of their special status, the, the investment potential they have, and also for drink green jobs creation on you know, sovereign uh, tribal nation lands. Well, I'm going to actually, I, I have some thoughts on that, but we have a, a representative from one of the tribes along the border, and so I'm going to ask you, Evaristo Cruz if he would like to specifically address that first. Thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that I think always comes up in tribal um, matters is, uh, is the issue of sovereignty. Uh, have, being able to allow tribes the ability to self-govern and, self, um, and to decide what path they're going to go. I think one of the things that is also very important for tribes is to make sure that um, there are so many offers coming onto tribal land. There's so many uh, private entities wanting to do business with tribes. Um, so for tribes, a lot, of, a lot of that comes to decision analysis and working with, with what, what the elders in, tribes, in, in tri tribal settings want to have in place. I think, uh, and I think speaking just about our tribe and where we're headed is having uh, uh, a, a comprehensive land management plan in place so that you can strategically locate areas and, and find out what it is uh, about the tribal setting and the land setting of, of where development needs to happen and where it needs to be protected. One of the things that you'll find that's critical in, in a tribal setting is the protection of natural resources and traditional lands because once a tribe does away with those uh, cultural resources and, uh, and cultural lands, identity is part of culture, uh, land, land uh, preservation. Um, so there are a lot of uh, there is a method uh, methodological approach that, that, that tribes are implementing, and a lot of it has to do with land management, uh, uh, identifying what resources can be dedicated. Um, but I think a lot of it is also going to be working with private industries or enterprises that have um, a view on economic development, but also understanding 
the very unique nature of a tribal setting and being sensitive to um, the fact that tribes run differently from states, from cities, and from the U.S. government. They run under a different set of values, and, and, and the most paramount of that is, is, the, is the cultural significance and protecting that cultural significance. So as, as, en as, as enterprises move forward toward developing energy, uh, alternative energy programs, they'll need to be sensitive to that. And, and tribes also need to also have uh, that planning in place. And um, a, lot of those, a lot of times you're not going to find that those two things are at the same point. So there's going to be a disconnect. So development is not going to be as quick, or it could be quicker. Uh, you have, you'll have far less uh, maybe hoops to jump through in a tribal setting. You might be able to just get authorization. But at the same time, those two concepts, uh, where private industry is coming from. But uh, I guess going with that, tribes are going to look at developing their own industries. They're going to look at partnerships, not necessarily allowing an industry to come in and develop. Uh, any tribe, uh, uh, there's a couple of examples, and I'm sorry I can't pick them out right now, but there are tribes that are looking towards partnerships rather than land leases, rather than allowing uh, a, uh, a, an industry to just come in and develop. And those are things that I think allows the tribe to retain uh, its sovereignty and, um, and be able to define where they're headed as far as land use and uh, the, the use of natural resources. I'm not sure if I've addressed some of the... Very much so. Can I just add one comment? Yes. How would the outside... How could the outside uh, entities be more sensitive to and aware of what you would want to see as, you know, representative of your tribe and the other tribes so that you shorten this time so that you're already in a mutual respect type of relationship, not taking one, taking advantage of the other? Uh, and I think that's a really a key point. I'm glad you asked that. Um, one of the points that I've always brought up is when in doubt, consult. Uh, <laughs> Consultation with tribes is essential. Uh, one of the things that I do applaud uh, the current administration is trying to work with all federal agencies to update and make sure that their consultation policy uh, keeps, uh, has been updated to reflect changes in consultation. So um, some, of the, some of the problems that, that do happen is when tribes are not brought into the picture uh, in time. Uh, a lot of times you'll find that uh, on a checklist of things to do, there's a checklist, a box that says, have I consulted with, the, with, uh, with tribes? And sometimes it's treated as a, as a checklist. You've checked off that you've consulted with the tribe. And a consultation with the tribe is consultation that the tribe deems consultation. And that's the way it needs to be understood, that the tribe is the, is the entity in this regard that'll determine when consultation has taken place. So um, I guess uh, without having, without uh, pointing to a specific situation, I think just addressing that idea, that concept, that uh, consultation with tribes as early and as often as possible will always be able to build those relationships of trust. Because at this point it is building a relationship of trust. It's being able to show that there's enough concern there to include tribes at the beginning of a project. And, um, and I think that's probably the best way to go. Uh, I think that uh, there's been examples where that hasn't happened. A lot of work has been done. A lot has been implemented. There's projects that are about to start. And the tribe, uh, it may have been a benefit to the tribe. But because consultation was not observed, because it wasn't done in the way that the tribe feels that consultation took place, then that project will, will, will get nixed. If there's any federal funding, it will get stopped. And that's something that a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, municipalities don't understand. And unfortunately, they learn that lesson late in the project life. And it, it puts both parties in a bad light when it could have been avoided just by simply consulting when in doubt. And if I could add one thing, and then we've got a question over here, and, and that is the Council for Energy Resource Tribes exists in this country. It's a very strong 
uh, entity that formed up to actually address tribes that had oil, basically fossil fuel resources. And they have, they're working very quickly to kind of retool and address this issue because while some of the same tribes who have oil, coal, et cetera, are also looking at renewables, a lot of tribes that had none of the fossil fuel resources on their reservations are, do in fact have renewable. And so you're, you, it gets back to that question around outreach and education as well. You've got a new set of players coming in, but you have a, a lot of knowledge and experience in Indian country about how to, to do negotiating, contracting, et cetera, and how to work with the federal government. And so I think taking advantage of some of those more, those are national groups, but certainly are working on the border as well. Yes? Yeah. Actually, just to add to what you said. <laughs> just a point of reference. Also, a number of the national laboratories have programs in support of DOE's program for tribal um, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And so Sandia National Labs, for example, in New Mexico, which I know most clearly because I'm from there, um, has a program that works with tribes, uh, not just in New Mexico, in fact, all over the West, to encourage um, energy sustainability and economic development associated with it. And this is run by Native American people and, and with the tribes. So it's a, it, it, even though it's under a federal aegis, it has a direct connection that's rooted locally in local decision making. So it's a good point of reference for you. Are there any other comments or questions? We're going to need to transition into our next panel. We have a, an outstanding group of people who are getting ready to talk to us here, so I don't see any. Then what I'd like to do is please do not go anywhere. We just You can stand up and sit back down, but we have a 3 o'clock panel, um, and Duncan Wood will be moderating. So if I could ask the panelists to please come forward.